can get started at 431. And we'll do, we need to do verbal attendance. I caught it, so okay. thank you. So you want to do introductions? Oh, so we have some new folks. Well, yeah. of course. <laughs> Uh, well, I can start. I think you all know me, but uh, welcome um, and uh, delighted uh, to have two new board members joining us today. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm Bruce, another Bruce. Um, and how long do you want me to introduce myself? <laughs> um, a short or long version? I think short version is good. Short version. Uh, Bob Lee's fault that I'm here. Thank you very much, Bob. <laughs> he emailed my wife and I to see if either one of us wanted to join the board. Um, so I'm happy to be here, happy to learn some stuff. I'm a retired neurologist here in town. And uh, hobbies are music and chess and some philosophy. And something else I can't remember right now. <laughs> I'm Tom Kurtz. This is I'm on my second term. We had a Bruce one, and I had the opportunity to inter uh, interview the candidates, and uh, he st they still showed up. <laughs> 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 Uh, I'm vice chair. Uh, as you, you know, I almost started the meeting, but we saw the gallery coming down the hallway. Retired hospital CEO, by the way. I'm Bruce, Bruce Montgomery. Um, I was the, uh, res uh, the archives research director for, I don't know, 27 years, director of the Research Archives at the University of Colorado. And uh, I've served on this board a long time ago, from the 90s into, I've been, I, I actually moved to Longmont in the early 90s and was on the board from about, I don't know, well before Eric got here, from about 93 until the early 2000s, something like that, right? And uh, now I've come back. <laughs> so, uh, uh, pulled you back. Yeah, it's uh, the the development of the museum has been uh, really remarkable mm. in, in that time. It started out in a little garage right across from the library. It used to be what the oh, it was a garage. Yeah, well, there's a city, yeah, a city little garage, garage yeah, warehouse. But they turned it turned into a little museum, and then the whole process of building this museum, and now it's been expanded and so it's really grown with the city. It's really a remarkable um, to see the development of the of the museum. I'm Elizabeth Bodwin. I'm the current curator of history. Started you make that sound like it's just very temporary. Uh, <laughs> I, I started I only started six months ago. Well you may be getting a little more <laughs> sensitive territory. <laughs> Filling big shoes from Eric who's been in the role for a very long time. Doing it very well. <laughs> um, I'm Callie Cordova. I'm the chair. This is my second term. Um, and then I also work as a library associate in the area. I'm Catlin Keenan. Um, my name gives Americans trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a non-American name, it's Gaelic, is, is the origin of my name. I am a professor at Front Range Community College. I teach philosophy uh, and women and gender studies. And I'm Catherine Cox. Uh, this is my first time back since I fell. And broke my shoulder in two places. Um, this is my first term, and I'm a retired event planner due to COVID. And now I'm an artist, I paint. Not anything recently. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Linda Buxbaum. I think this is my first term. I'm going to be ending sometime next year around 625. I looked at it and I said, oh my. <laughs> So I'm a retired uh, social worker from New York, New Jersey. 
I'm Bob Lee. Um, finished one year here and uh, now up for three more. So I'm in for the long run. Um, I spent uh, many years on the Transportation Advisory Board. This is way more fun. Um, and uh, I'm glad to be here. So. Too many rights on yeah. Oh, RTD, street rehabilitation. Yeah. Oh. All right. I'm Joanne McCoy, the executive assistant. And how long have you been here? <laughs> okay, so that's embarrassing. I've been here for about 30 years. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> did you start in the garage? I did. I started sweeping the garage. Um, and then do we have any public to be heard? Then um, I get a motion to approve the minutes from last time. Are there any corrections or amendments that we need to make? I move that we approve the minutes. I second. And then I think we're ready for sessions. You want to do a vote? Oh, right. just for grins. Just for grins. <laughs> do we all want to vote? Thank you. All right. We have a bunch of stuff this time. Um, first off, we received eight modern photocopies of photos that we do not have in the archive, as far as I can tell. Um, they're mostly related to this Longmont Realty Company, which uh, was housed in the Emerson and Buckingham Bank um, in the 1910s or so. That building is no longer there, it's not an alleyway, um, but both exterior and interior pictures. Hmm. Of the bank? Yeah, and there's a few others. There's one of where Ziggy's is now, we didn't have that particular angle of that photo, and there's, there's some unknown ones that are probably long on. Might as well take so these are photocopies? Yeah, like, yeah, they're modern printouts. I don't know if she had the original or where um, it was her um, deceased husband's. So she just kind of found them. Oh, well, that's pretty neat. And I'm correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, he had a connection to the owner of the realty. He, didn't he own <coughs> Wayne Jurgens? Didn't he own Long Mont Realty and Insurance? Sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> he was. I didn't realize this was on, Wayne. Uh, yeah, Teresa. Yeah, Teresa's, okay, cool. um, so yeah, he was on the Friends of the Museum board back in the nineties. Yeah, it's crazy because Wayne was a tremendous supporter for the museum. It really got the Friends going at one point. Oh, great. Do we vote individually or at the end? Usually we vote everything all at once, unless the board wants to break it up. Any questions on this one? Mm -hmm. All right. So the building at the top, that's the... Uh, mm -hmm. It's just yeah. a long lot realty on the building. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the banner says something the same. Long realty company, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. But it was originally a bank. Huh. Yeah. Not yeah. that the right uh, bank, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, that one. Do we know why it was abolished? Um, building? Why was oh, it down? it's. I've never been able to figure out why they chose that building to tear down. It's the breezeway uh -huh. in the middle of the 300 block. Huh. And I think it was just, well, this is the middle. So <laughs> this is the one we're going to tear down. down. <laughs> um, it's like the buildings on either side are perfectly ordinary, you know, commercial structures. Then you have this amazing bank building. And and for a long time, I kept hoping that it was like, oh, it was just totally destroyed by the 60s when they um, were uh, getting ready to do the breezeways. And then I found an angle, and it's like, no, it was actually pretty intact, even in the 60s. Hmm. So just sad urban renewal to mistake. So when was it torn down? 70s? Uh, 60s. This was the first part, part of Longmont was what the organization was called. It was a precursor to the LDDA and they started building the breezeways 
and 300 block that connects to the parking lots behind. Shall we move on? Yeah. Where are my questions? <clears throat> you might need to use the mouse. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I got a phone call from a woman. Um, she lives in like Oregon, Washington State, but she grew up in Longmont. Her father owned the Telephone Exchange Building, which is 477 Main Street, so it's on the west, southwest corner of uh, Main Street at uh, where what? That's Fifth Avenue, it crosses. Yeah, those quarters, arcade. Yeah, it's an arcade. Yeah, mm -hmm. that needs to be demolished, too. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, so this building, uh, I don't have a picture of it, what it looked like before. So it's been renovated a couple times, and in the 60s, her dad put this sheath of brick up over all of the big windows um, to modernize it. Uh, he had it higher. He has some kind of uh, like either dentist or doctor um, practice, and uh, so he did that first, and then they eventually built a new building at 721 Fifth Ave, just kind of around the corner. So that's him standing at the lot before the building was built. It's the Barn Schwartz building. It is still there. It's got State Farm and I think Met Life insurance in it. Uh, it still says Barn Schwartz right on the side of the building. Um, so it's the kind of construction of that building. There's like six or seven photos of that. And then also a few photos from one of the Boulder County Fair parades. So we got the little chuck wagon. Um, I think this is her and her brothers in the back there. And that bank was also demolished, the ones behind that in that picture. So that's the that fourth, fourth in May, or fifth in May as well. So yeah, so that, like I did, you know, no brainer for these, I think, the, the show pictures of Longmont and uh, this is just a one off a group photo from 2009. It was the 90th anniversary of the Rotary Club, and everyone is identified. Um, there's Kenamotos in this uh, photo. There's a lot of names that I've seen. I think maybe Wayne Durbin's yeah. <laughs> photo. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's like a lot of kind of movers and shakers from the from around 2009. And I figured, yeah, it doesn't seem old now, but it's a good one for the archive. Uh, this was a large donation that has dwindled down. We've refined it over the course of maybe two months of conversation back and forth with this family. Um, the Newton family had 22 children. Um, they were <laughs> all from the same mother. Um, the, they had a farm out in need. Uh, and then when all the kids were grown, the parents moved to 619 Collier Street. One of their children, grown children, died tragically in a car accident in the 60s, orphaning six children who all then moved in with their grandmother at 619 and she raised them. Um, she died, I think, in the 1990s. Um, and it was actually her daughter, Helen Newton, who passed away and she was the last one her 619. And so it's her children, so the grandchildren, um, who approached us with all of this stuff. Um, their mother had planned on donating in her lifetime and never did. Uh, she had some conversations with Eric, like back in 2006 or something. Um, but so yeah, this was her children kind of doing good by her mom. Um, so we chose, uh, I took a bunch, I didn't want to, it was a lot of stuff, so I took some scans of the family and any buildings in need from their scrapbooks. And uh, there was a few items that multiple children used. They were a Catholic family. So we have this communion dress that we have photos of the, the two girls wearing that wearing it. Uh, the first communion prayer book. Um, I guess Helen Newton had to convert to Catholicism to get married. Um, apparently it was kind of a shotgun wedding. Uh, and so inside the prayer book is a little like, welcome to the family from her mother. 
uh, rose rubies, a really kind of cool 1940s irony, like um, play of iron. Uh, yeah, so kind of a cool story about this family. Oh, apparently five out of six, or four out of five, whatever, how many basketball players on a basketball team. Um, <laughs> I don't know sports. Um, the Mead basketball team was almost entirely made up of Newtons <laughs> at one point in the 1900s. <laughs> and they were like champ champions, I guess. Seems like most of the people in Longmont would be related to them in one way or another. You know, we had some they, we had some stuff laying out on the table because they'd just gotten dropped off, and then an older couple walked in just because they were here for the exhibits. And I said hello, and he looks down and he's like, "I know that guy." That's <laughs> this like ten year old kid in like this picture, and he's like, "I'm friends with him." I'm like, oh wow. <laughs> what kind of uh, farming do they do? I'm not sure. How many acres they have? How many the farm? The pictures of the farm, it was fairly small. Uh -huh. and I'm not sure if they were sort of sure proper kind of situation or not. I will have to ask. Uh, and Helen knew, or not Helen, the daughter, um, I can't remember her name, but she she was a very early flight attendant for United in the 1950s. And so we have pictures in the archive already of her. Um, and then there was another. Another person who would, who had started up like a children's daycare that was very popular in the seventies and eighties. So the children went on. Some of them stayed here in Longmont and started businesses and all that. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, we had a descendant of the Arbanoth come by with some uh, older photos. And kind of was working with uh, Dawn Lynn, who's an Arbanoff living in hygiene. Uh, she actually helped me figure out, we figured out some of the photos actually were not of people in Longmont, and she thankfully helped connect Sally with a museum in Pennsylvania, <laughs> where they were originally from. But this little girl was a, uh, later on, she was a early settler of Longmont, so we will be taking this. It hasn't arrived yet, but we've already agreed to um, add it to our archives. This is a crayon portrait. That's what Don Lynn called it. So these are what what those are. Um, they would take a photograph and then they would blow it up and print it very faintly on. Usually these were pretty large, like you know, this by this at least. Um, and then an artist would go over the photograph with the crayon or. So it's sort of a combination of a photograph and a uh, hand-drawn portrait. Okay. Huh. My They're crayons cool. only took me the stick figures. <laughs> you can really tell in them. the dress that it's like the kind of quickly drawn in. It's Is this a way of colorizing face? then? Yes. Then? Yes. Yeah. Some of them have a little bit of color to them. This one doesn't. It's also because you couldn't print a photo that large, so if you wanted something big to hang on your wall, you that's needed that's a, cool. um, an artist to do it. Any questions on this one? Kelsey, can I ask you a question? Sure. Do these families, when you collect from these families that have a, a long history here in Longmont, do they provide any kind of written narrative? Sometimes. Or do they just kind of tell you? And I mean, what I'm getting at is that it would be very interesting if they wrote, were able to, or were willing to write a kind of a narrative of their family history as is the documentation to go along with the uh, photographs. This, this is very interesting. Yeah, this one, this family is pretty well, at least especially for about their settler history, uh, documented. The Newtons, they actually gave me a family tree. Um, they, act, they also gave me these, one of the kids wrote books about their experience growing up here. Um, so they gave me some copies of those as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll all be added to the archive. Okay. Hmm. 
Uh, this was deposited in the Friends book sale, and the Friends brought it here. It is 1896 souvenir of the First Colorado Regiment. It's got listings of everyone who's involved, which includes a few long launchers, and there's some kind of cool ads for like Coors and Xavier and um, various lines. So it's it's kind of a interesting old book that um, these documents those veterans from Long Mondo were involved in this regiment. I'm not exactly sure why they published this or where they handed it out, uh, but it's a, it's a nice uh, let's see, another little one-off donation. Uh, this was actually kind of cool once I really started to look at it. The very front, so this is all hand-drawn, this owl on a moon with like uh, holly and ivy. <laughs> and inside it, it, the first page says, this selected by peoples of grade seven and eight, Long Colorado, 1906. And so it is all kind of famous quotes, lots of Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Lee Greenleaf Whittier, that kind of, um, you know, with Benjamin Franklin quotes, and but it has the name of the student that submitted it. So it'll say like Abigail Allen, and then a the little quote. Uh, okay, this one is something that has been in the archive for a long time. It came from the public library. I would like to add it to the collect, formally add it to the collection and give it a number and track it. Uh, it is an 1877 kind of oversized atlas, it's about this big, filled with colored maps of Colorado. Um, and each one shows kind of a different thing. I think the one that I took a picture of shows sort of like where the mining is versus where's the coal, where's the gold, where's the dime, you know, not diamonds, but gold and various things that you can mine. Um, what is agricultural? Uh, so, and it's, you know, just after the founding of Long Lawns, it kind of gives an idea of like, ooh, if you were an East Coaster, you were kind of like, oh, where do I want to settle, settle or where do I want to invest? Um, it gives you an idea of the resources here in Colorado in the 1870s. Uh, this one is not on the sheet that went out. So maybe let's do a vote well, on all the ones, um, and then we can discuss this one separately. This is a purchase rather than a purchase. Uh, any other questions on any of the donations? So, is there any reason to not want one of these or more of them to be accessed? Um, I think what, what I would say is it's always good for the board to raise questions because, and I will someday show you an example of something where the board should have raised a question. <laughs> the uh, previous curator, uh, a car lost its hubcap on her front lawn and she brought it in and said, well, we should add this to the collection. And it's like, <laughs> it's a random hubcap. You don't even know where it's from. Uh, I was not on that. <laughs> <laughs> and the board was like, oh, hubcap, fine, great, done. And so, you know, there, not that I think we would do that, but you know, I think I would say it's always worth just asking. Well, what's what's the significance of this? The long one, or what's, and um, there there have been a few times um, when you know the board has provided either before we can accept it, we need more information, or in a few cases, yeah, this doesn't really fit after all, and, and so we've you know I like to not to take it. Um, so, but if there aren't aren't questions about that, then you know. and we don't have any deaccessions or you know things to get rid of from the museum of this this meeting. But this board also approves that. Mm -hmm. uh, say we're like, oh, we identify the hubcap as something that maybe we don't want to be caring for in perpetuity. <laughs> uh, you guys are the ones that would have the final say of whether we actually get rid of it. So it's a little bit of like, okay, we don't want to take anything that when you know ten years later we're going to just end up doing the opposite work <laughs> for. And we did just last month or last yeah. meeting mm -hmm. uh, eliminate. 
Yeah, a bunch of 1960s. Yeah. Well, I think you sent you were sending them to New York or someplace. A that, bunch of things went to New York that, that were more appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll move to uh, acquire the, the sessions as presented. Do we have a second? I'll second. And then a vote. All in favor? So the next thing's a little different. It would be in addition to the collection, but we would be spending museum money to purchase it. Uh, Jared Thompson, curator of exhibits, um, had had a connection with this artist, indigenous artist, um, who has been doing a lot of work in the Denver area. He had uh, this particular print was shown at History Colorado a few years um, in an art exhibit that they did, an indigenous art exhibit. Um, we would like to include more contemporary indigenous um, artwork in our history exhibit. Um, and this is one that's available for sale. Uh, I did find an artist statement about it. He often combines sort of contemporary imagery with traditional indigenous imagery, um, portraiture. I believe this picture also became a mural inside of it. Building a, a, an art gallery in Telluride. Hmm. Uh, so, this would be a signed framed print. The cost is $800. Is the artist from this area? So, uh, Greg Deal, he is uh, Pyramid Lake Paiute. Um, he was the guest curator for our duality um, exhibition. He lives in this area now. I don't know if he was born here, but um, definitely very representative of the you know, sort of contemporary indigenous population in Colorado, uh, which is you know, no longer just one or two tribes, but you know comes from tribes all across the country. So he does have a local connection and a local connection to the museum. Yes, yes, he, we worked with him quite extensively. He. Oh, well, this work was not in the exhibit. We couldn't afford the work that was in the <laughs> museum gallery. Um, but, um, uh, you know, he selected all of the works and, uh, that were in the duality exhibit at the museum last spring. And did the pre a presentation as well, right? And did brought presentations. His band, the Dead Pioneers, played in our auditorium. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's quite a character. He also was actually the um, keynote speaker at there was a national museum conference held in Denver last year, and he was one of the keynote speakers at that. So he's got um, a lot of connections. Um, Do you have uh, complementary collections, complementary images? Um, not uh, necessarily. This is kind of our first um, indigenous art work contemporary indigenous art that we've, we've collected. Um, but it is actually something that we identified when we developed the collections plan uh, a year and a half ago. That um, One of the ways to tell the indigenous story in a way that acknowledges that you know, indigenous people are not just part of history, but also contemporary, um, which is something that a lot of indigenous folks raise as this is a, a constant issue for them is, oh, well, you still live in a teepee, right? You still ride a horse. <laughs> no, I'm a modern person just like you. Um, I have a cell phone just like you. Um, is um, by collecting contemporary indigenous art rather than you know, 19th century um, indigenous art. So is this something you would envision as part of the remake of Front Range Rising? Yeah. So, Originally, when we first started the conversation, um, and we didn't know how quickly we were going to be redoing Front Range Rising, it was envisioned as replacing, there's a couple of artworks in Front Range Rising, our core history exhibit, that uh, were done by an artist who is um, slated to go on trial for sexual assault. So and that's the Yoda so, piece. Um, that's the Yoda piece. And so we were like, we really don't want to have this art um, in our in our gallery any longer. 
um, that since that exhibit is actually probably coming down next year as part of um, the, the renovation of the museum we um, I'm not sure whether we will have time to get this and get it scanned and get the new one produced in time to get it into that before that old exhibit goes away but we still felt like having this then as a kind of ready-made thing that we could put into the, the next iteration. So this would be on display at some point? Mm -hmm. So that's certainly our, our intent. Goal. We don't yeah. have anything right now where we can say, right. yes, it's definitely going to be in this spot. So the, Eric, but, is, this, uh, oh, is this a new collecting area that you uh, intend to pursue? I, I think, you know, within pretty limited resources that we have to collect Art. There was a, a beautiful piece that was in the agriculture exhibit that was by another indigenous artist, Sarah Sense, that combined you know, um, maps from the museum's collection um, uh, with uh, native uh, images of native plants. And, uh, wow, this would be amazing! And it was like eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> okay. Is it, um, is, it, uh, is it a potential um, fundraising? Uh, so yeah, certainly once we get past the capital campaign, <laughs> and we're we're able to you know fundraise for other other things again. Oh, if you say you know, we're opening up this new uh, initiative um, to collect Native American art in the region and use that as your platform to fundraise. Yeah, that might be a very good hook for mm -hmm. for, for people. And you could buy it, and you could pay the eighty thousand yeah. <laughs> dollars. And uh, I will add that a lot of museums are doing this kind of combination of pairing contemporary art with um, older objects of uh, you know, from tribes. So if you go to the Denver Art Museum, you go to their new Indigenous Art. Um, galleries, they've done that throughout the entire exhibit. I also went to the Buffalo Bill Center for the West, and they also did, did maybe a little bit on a smaller scale. Um, so they'll, they'll talk about the tribes, but every, you know, 20 feet would be a contemporary art piece, interpreting what has it, what is in the gallery by someone who's telling the truth for now. That is cool. I was just there. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a question. Um, we are a sister city, mm -hmm. and um, don't do we have anything from the reservation? You know, any any artists who who are there, or you know, we've we have been trying to build those connections. There is a beautiful quilt in the Civic Center that's kind of. The museum at least keeps an eye on it. <laughs> it's not officially in our collection because um, it was donated directly to the city rather than to the, um, to the museum. But um, but that's another area where we absolutely would love to yeah, build this. I know I can speak for a little bit with the sister cities. Um, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing is building trust. Right. So you know, there was a lot of damage done historically and a lot of distrust. So even once we you know, signed, and it was during my term when we signed the, the coalition between the Northern Arapaho and the city of Longmont, that was fairly new and there was a lot of um, preparation and building um, trust and repairing um, just, just past damage. And, and so that was years in the making. And then we're here you know where we're at today and I think there is interest I've gone a couple of times for visits and it's seen in when we meet with the elders there is interest but I think it's going to take time and we're really looking for a kind of organic um, flow where kind of you know folks on the in the art realm in that area will kind of lead the way and you know well, what what would you be open to as far as any kind of um, inner city um, or inner community um, art opportunity. So it, it's, it's working, we're working on it. <laughs> but I think, you know, we've, with the youth going over there, and then next month their youth will be coming to us. Um, and, you know, and that's something huge. Right. For the longest right. time, they would not share their children with us. So right. being able to, wow. to, to do that. 
So that's, you know, we, we've come a long way. So I think, you know, as we continue these, um, building those friendships, um, we're hoping to, to kind of move to the next level. Not there yet, but we're getting there. Well, that makes me wonder, acquiring images like this from indigenous artists who are from Colorado, right. can help. Yes, right? yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And only, yes. Are we doing any kind of photographic or any kind of you know stories uh, or press on you know? I'll be talk to um, Courtney from Sister Cities. I know she's spearheading and or and doing the organization, um, and then I just show up where she tells me to show up. Because <laughs> I remember um, a year ago we did some really good stuff on mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, talking about the various problems, mm -hmm. uh, duality. Yeah. Yes, it was fabulous, yes. and I wanted more. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I really think we need to keep the conversation going. Oh, yeah. Constantly, mm -hmm. and, and bringing in things like this would be great. Yeah. You know, having the kids talk about their experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions on the succession? anyone like to move to accept the succession? I'll move. Is there a second? All second. Okay, let's all vote. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Great. I will also give one update. If you may remember a few meetings ago, we voted to accept the mural from the 1990s. Uh, and Maka and I did a oral history with uh, the program director at the time, and she brought all kinds of scrapbooks. So that may be something that we'll be adding later, but it will be shown at Day of the Dead. Um, and we're hoping of doing, nice. getting as many of the students that worked on them in the 1990s together um, to do sort of like a kind of reunion and, and be a part of our, uh, our, our Day of the Dead exhibit. So Anna's really been hitting that up. She's been <laughs> really great. <laughs> Guys, have you heard from Gala? No, I have not been able to get in touch with him at all. Okay. <laughs> Someone who has a real connection with him is going to reach out. <laughs> like, you know, just a random name. Uh, um, I have his email and I have, they said contact me via Instagram and I tried. <laughs> Ready to move on to the report from the Okay, so we have two months worth of reports since we did not meet last month. And I will just touch on a few things from, from May, June. Um, I mentioned in the May, June report that I was headed to the History Leadership Institute in Indianapolis, and that was an amazing experience. Um, two weeks with a cohort of 19 people and speakers from museums from around the country um, talking about not, not the nuts and bolts of you know how you do a budget, but how does your budget reflect your values? Um, not like how to build an exhibit, but how do you do an exhibit that um, expresses hard and difficult issues? It was a wonderful presentation from the director at the Lincoln's Cottage, which is a small museum in Washington, D.C., where uh, Abraham and Mary Lincoln went in the summers. And one of the things, one of the summers, was when they were mourning the death of their son. And the director was saying how when she um, was working there, she actually lost a child. And she started thinking about we should do an exhibit talking about grief and child loss. And it's been just an incredible experience for them, very small space. It's about, I think, the size of this room. But uh, there's this beautiful weeping willow where you can write you know, the name of, of uh, someone that you've lost and hang it on the tree. And, and just, you know, people have conversations about um, grief and how that is in a museum setting. So, you know, just just people taking museums kind of to a, a next level. Um, so it's, it was it was a great experience, and it's one that I'm gonna you know, 
continue to be working through and, and exploring with, with everyone about you know how can we really be exploring and living our values as a museum. So um, I was really honored to be chosen for it and uh, really pleased to be able to go and thankful for the staff for filling in in the you know, two weeks when I'm gone. Um, uh, mentioned the Lego exhibition um, has been hugely successful over there June 1st and has been really steady, um, great, great attendance ever since then. Uh, and I think that's probably all I'm going to talk about from the May June report a little while ago. Um, moving on to June July, uh, first item on there is that we are continuing to move forward with design for the next phase of the museum expansion. So you can see the courtyard is very close to being done. It's every every month I feel like I'm saying like, it's, it's just a little bit closer. We've, we've had a few supply chain issues that have held up getting it finally done, but um, we should be, it should be ready for operation uh, hopefully by next week. So, um, and then tell you some last enhancements that'll come in in August. Um, but then the phase two, which is our gallery expansion, that um, we submitted to the city's design review committee. Um, it's kind of been going back and forth a little more than we had hoped in terms of getting um, some issues resolved primarily around um, you know, the, the plans for the drainage of this uh, campus are now 25 years old almost. And, uh, we, we hoped we could just update our little corner of it, but planning is making us really do a, a fuller update. So, um, so that's delayed things a little more. But um, we are continuing. What do you got to do a big yeah. environmental study? Not, not luckily, not an environmental impact study. dogs. Like that. <laughs> it's it's basically just that um, <laughs> the you know the original plan said well there isn't really going to be any development around the museum and or around you know the, the campus and you know we know now 25 years later there will be there'll someday be development to our west there'll be you know, some some sort of more park development to our north and so you know because we are the first ones developing and I said you need to figure out how to make all that work from a perspective. so that is uh, well it sounds like you have to start from scratch again so I mean, luckily, just just on kind of some of the drainage issues, we've got a very talented civil engineer that's already you know, working on it. So probably, uh, hopefully, uh, a month to six week delay in our, in our process, um, which is news I got today. I got before so that just to be clarify, no one is, it has is has plans to develop uh, along. Uh, here. That is, there is a developer. That project has actually been in the works now for 17 years. What does he want to build? So uh, it's, it's basically a, a small Double. shopping center. Oh. Um, so, um, so in another 17 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well. Trader Joe's, there. That's what I really want. <laughs> a what? Like a Trader Joe's or some kind of market. Uh, yeah. Or... yeah. Mm -hmm. But we tried to get Trader Joe's in. Um, when Lucky's uh, closed down, they were looking. The town was looking at Trader Joe's. But uh, one of the things I read was that they have one uh, so close. I think in Fort Collins. There's one in Boulder. One in Boulder, and they don't. They they didn't. They felt it was too much. Hmm. to put in, but we definitely need it. Yeah. A grocery store on the side of town. So anyway, that that <laughs> project is, um, I mean, it's, it's up to the developer. They will move forward when, when they feel it's right. So well, um, it's a waste um, to, you know, hopefully right. they'll know it. Um, but um, so that is, that is, but it is in process. So we are, we are moving forward with uh, with design review and, and continuing with, with construction uh, package as well. Um, then I really
really want to talk about the Sunset Soiree. There are cards there, if folks could hand those around. Feel free to take as many as you would like. Um, this is our really inaugural fundraising event. Um, and it is focused on the capital campaign. Um, uh, September 7th, um, it, it will be also the unveiling of the new courtyard. Um, so we'll have a ribbon cutting uh, for the courtyard. We'll have a band. There'll be um, uh, food, uh, drinks. There'll be kind of showcase of different things that the museum is doing. Um, tickets are now live. Uh, you should all be getting one of these in the mail, but I would uh, hope you all uh, will mark your calendars and buy tickets now because um, this is a really key event for us. And if you know of other folks that you think are museum supporters and would uh, enjoy coming to this event, uh, please uh, hand the card to them. Uh, let us know if you've got someone that you know has questions or um, uh, the tickets are uh, being sold through supportlongmontmuseum.org. Uh, it's $100 a ticket, um, uh, but that does include you know, the uh, dinner, drinks, um, entertainment, and then there will be a paddle raiser fundraiser. So, so um, uh, we're in the midst of planning for that. You see it's all throughout the director's report different people working on different aspects of it but um, it's, it's really the next big push in our capital campaign so uh, we are very excited about uh, both unveiling our courtyard and taking the next step forward with the capital campaign um, so any questions on I know a while back we were about 80 or 85 percent uh, we're, we're still uh, around 86 percent i think is, is where we are now um there's there's one uh grant that we should hear about in august uh dollars grant and if we get that that'll, that'll bump us up uh, a couple more percent and and then you know this this fundraiser is certainly we're hoping to put a big dent in, in what we have right now. I have to apologize, I have to go back. Was it an eight or ten million dollar? Uh, 8.1 million. 8.1 million mm -hmm. is our, our campaign goal. And how much is there left to go? Uh, about uh, 1.1 million. Totally. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From the board alone, really. All right, all right. <laughs> and you also finished that. We didn't even have to do this one. <laughs> no, we no, forgot no, to no, tell no, you no, that. No, no. <laughs> now we tell you. That's right. You two are. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I think this this event will be a, a great chance to see what's what's going on. We'll have renderings, updated renderings uh, of the. Uh, plans. Uh, we'll have a video with folks talking about kind of how the museum has impacted their lives and, and um, as I say the different departments within the museum will kind of be showcasing what, uh, what they're doing, uh, with some photo opportunities and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on that? So I've got I have kind of a weird question. So um, so you've got Exhibit space, you learned about this nice uh, grief exhibit. So, but how do you decide as a museum director whether to go with something emotional and touching like that or like a Lego exhibit? Oh, that, that is a great question. And I will say one of the things that we have really struggled with is because we have one gallery that changes. And so we have tended to look at, you know, what is an exhibit that is really going to re be uh, resonate with the most folks in Longmont. And so we do uh, evaluations. I can talk a little bit in this about something called a card sort. Well, we have a stack of exhibit ideas, and we hand it out. We handed it out at a couple of the summer concerts, and we ask people, you know, sort this in order by which one you're most likely to come and visit the museum. Um, 
that uh, approach is, uh, I think, um, something that we've had to do because we only have the one gallery. But as we do an expansion, as we have the possibility of a more flexible gallery space and can do uh, multiple spaces, we may be able to do a larger exhibit that um, can draw in large numbers and then a smaller exhibit that's you know more perhaps an emotional impact or that has a really strong local uh, connection that you know highlights uh, a local artist or an aspect of local history. Um, those are pieces that that we've been able to do only infrequently because um, you know we have we have revenue goals that we need to meet and things like that. So um, I'm really hopeful with this expansion that we will be able to do a little bit more of the. Um, uh, more emotional exhibits, the more um, complicated topic type exhibits, um, while still having you know exhibits that are bringing in you know, folks from across the community and across the region, because that's certainly a big part of our mission too, is, is to make sure we are serving a broad swath of the community. Um, so we do you know evaluations to choose things. We look at what is available. You know, Traveling exhibits, we're typically having to choose um, three years or more out because um, really good exhibits that are you know, in our price range get reserved very quickly. So you know, we are um, planning multiple years out for uh, exhibits that uh, we can bring in that, that fit our space. And there's, there's a lot of constraints around that, but a lot of it just deals with what we really feel like the community is going to. Resonate. How are these national exhibits organized? Who, who does it? Um, so there are companies, companies that, um, okay. uh, so for example, the Picturing the West exhibit, the part mm -hmm. of the exhibit we have right before this, mm -hmm. um, it was organized by a company called Art to Art Circulating Exhibits, um, and they work with private collectors who have collections. In this case, all of that came from one private collection. Um, uh, New York City um, collectors that actually have unbelievable photography <laughs> collections. The third exhibit we've had from those um, uh, particular collectors. But um, others actually develop the exhibit in house and then travel it. And then there's also um, some sort of museum consortiums that we're just starting to explore where it's almost like more of a lone network and, and we work. You know, with a number of different museums that make um, artwork available for loan, and then you know they have. Is that, of, this is the are concept. those less expensive than the ones? They actually tend to be more expensive because oh, um, typically original art, just the cost of creating and shipping sure things that aren't sure photography right. is is pretty you know straightforward to create and ship. Right. Um, but once you get into you know, uh, sculpture work on canvas, it's you know, sure. a lot more challenging. Yeah. Um, so for example, we're, we're looking at potentially uh, an MC Escher or an Andy Warhol exhibit to open the expansion with um, those are between seventy-five and $100,000 to rent. Um, so significantly more than what, what we are paying now, which is typically in the uh, $30,000 range. For how long? Um, that's for three months. So, yeah, it's um, uh, definitely with this expansion, we're kind of into uh, a new level of what we're going to need. How, uh, um, how much does the city give you for, for the traveling? Uh, uh, exhibits? Traveling exhibits in our budget uh, is about uh, 25000 a year for the rental of the exhibit. And then we have um, staff and so forth. And so that's why we've done a lot more in-house developed exhibits. That's not very much. Can't the city double it? Triple it? <laughs> we're hearing from but all the departments right now. <laughs> yeah, but we're the important one. We're the fun one. Yes. So well, I'll, I'll just highlight a few more things in our director's, our director's report. Um, we are starting planning for 2026, which is the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the 150th anniversary of Colorado statehood. Um, and there is a America 250 Colorado 150 commission 
that um, uh, meets periodically, and they'll be meeting here in October. Um, so we are starting planning. And, uh, in, in the coming months, I'm going to have the city council approve a proclamation um, uh, recognizing that you know the American 250 color 150. Is well, you got to pass that through um, the board first. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's that's one of the things that's going to be on the on the city council agenda in the coming months. It isn't I haven't scheduled it yet, but um, the the commission is encouraging all the communities in the area to do that as kind of a show of support for for this event. Um, summer camp is actually this is our last week of summer camp um, so we've had um, lots of kids coming in every day for a whole variety of different camps it's been really fun to see them all come in I know uh, 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 Kylie <laughs> lots of smiles on the way out the door today though so lots of kids lots of kids had a great time here um, and then um, we've had two summer concerts out in the parks. Uh, one Willow Farm Park that was uh, in the mid in between rainstorms, so not not as big a crowd as, as we might have hoped. But then an amazing crowd for Denver Tyco and Collier Park last week, probably 450 or so folks. Um, and we've got one next week in Carr Park up in uh, North Central Long Island. So and that will be. Uh, Kutundara, uh, which is an African-inspired uh, um, musical performance. So excited! Uh, come and check it out. There are mm -hmm. free concerts. And then the final thing, I just uh, on page three of the um, uh, director's report, you can see in June of 2023 we had uh, 1,300 people come through our exhibits in June for mm -hmm. the agriculture exhibit. In June of 2024, for Legos, we had almost wow. quadruple wow. that, um, wow. basically, for Lego. Um, so uh, it's, it's been a very, very successful exhibit. And I guess the gift shop sales are related to the Lego exhibit. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So when you look at that yeah. big bump. My grandson mm -hmm. just went to it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like maybe you should bring it back once every five years. <laughs> <laughs> so we will, so the expansion will have a dedicated children's gallery. So we are hoping that it will essentially, the museum won't be, oh, when there's a special exhibit, I'll bring my children there. It will be, I will bring my children there regularly because there will be always lots of activities for them to do and come back. And visit, you know? uh, so we're really excited about, we, we anticipate a pretty significant increase in attendance once we open that. And the Denver Art Museum, one of the things I always liked was the fact that they had downstairs, we could go in and they had things for kids to do, mm -hmm. you know, and um, my, my daughter just came today with my grandson and she said, I'm glad you're on the board, Mom. You know, we need this, you know, blah, blah, blah. She really, they really loved it. Good, good. Is there any discussion about keeping part since this was like an in-house? We've we've definitely of keeping it for the children's gallery. Um, probably not for the children's gallery. We really want that to be kind of a fresh experience. That's this is designed to last, you know, six months. Ideally, the children's gallery is going to be built out of, you know, super durable materials, so it will last longer and and be, you know, um, uh, the, the basic concept is, is kind of dealing with uh, dreams right now. So some really sort of fantastical landscapes and so forth. So um, it's an exciting concept, still in the early phases, but we may well bring back Lego or pieces of Lego as um, in our flex gallery or as kind of filler, if particularly as, as construction schedules flex, we may need to just we're going to have a part of Lego again because um, uh, we have a gallery available for a time. So um, uh, we are, we're still trying to figure that out because we're also possibly going to either travel that exhibit or sell it to another museum, uh, which is what we did with the last Lego exhibit. We uh, traveled it to one other museum and then sold it to uh, uh, 25,000. So, yeah, yeah, I think at least. Yeah, at least. <laughs> Thank you. And then I don't have a 
report. Do we have any unfinished business that needs to be addressed? Any new business? How's uh, art in public places? Any developments there? Um, they've got a lot of projects going. They're they're doing um, projects right now in two parks that are under under development. Um, as well as all of the um, sort of ongoing annual projects, um, the shock art where they paint the shock art boxes. That mm -hmm. uh, voting for those just closed last Friday, and um, the art on the move, the temporary artworks around town. Those were just installed uh, new ones about six weeks ago. Um, so yeah, they have a lot going on. Aren't they? Have any other board comments or board questions? Would anyone like to move to adjourn the meeting? <laughs> Seven seconds. Uh, all in favor? Hey. Yes. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah.